Well, welcome back to our second day in regards to a power series. And we're going to focus all of our energy on different operations or properties that pertain to a power series. We're going to kind of experiment with different things that are legal versus illegal as far as what we can do with our power series. Uh, specifically, we're going to put a lot of energy into differentiating and integrating uh, some well-known power series, specifically the geometric ones that we spent a lot of energy on yesterday. Now, for our first couple of properties, I want you to assume that f of x is some random function that's represented uh, by the given series, and then g of x is another distinct, unique function represented by a slightly different power series with a different coefficient, b sub n. Now, the first property that I want to throw at you is, is a really neat one that's going to save our bacon later in the year is if I want to evaluate f of kx I'm allowed and, and, and treat k like a constant like a coefficient so it's almost like you know f of 2x or f of 5x I'm allowed to substitute that kx strictly in for the x here so that the whole thing's being raised to the nth power or in other words, we could say the coefficient a sub n times k to the n times x to the n. And that's our first property. Our second property, another very handy one. I'll try to switch up the colors here a little bit. Our second property says that if uh, we want to evaluate f of x to the m power. Again, very similarly to property number two is I'm allowed to strictly substitute the x to the m into x's place as such. And then we could clean it up just a whisker and say, well, anytime you have a power raised to a power, we're going to multiply those two exponents and get x to the mn. And of course, the parentheses then are very optional. Our third property is another the kind of a common sense one I like to say. It says if you want to add two functions, you know, or subtract two functions for that matter, f plus g or f minus g of x, we're actually allowed to add or subtract their their particular series. So it's kind of like taking, all right, here's the series for f plus or minus the series for g. Okay? And because there's like terms there, we could focus on strictly adding or subtracting the coefficients and then bring the like term along for the ride. And so basically we're saying you can condense two series into one series as long as there are like terms. Now there's a grand total of five properties or operations we're going to go over today. We've already killed three out of the five, but we saved the two most important ones for, for last here. Um, but I think it's going to make a ton of sense when you see it work itself out. And basically, a property number four, or operation number four, basically says we're allowed to differentiate these series. So we've already said that f of x is represented by a sub n, x to the n. And if we assume that the series starts with n equals zero, and then expanded out, we'd get a sub zero plus a sub one x to the first plus a sub two x squared and so on and so on and so on. We are allowed to differentiate and say well hey f prime of x is equivalent to now here's where I want to throw in an extra asterisk before I go any further. I want you to tell yourself that n is what I like to call the dummy variable. Okay which basically means it looks like it's a variable, but by the time you expand it out, it no longer exists. You know, this is what I call the expanded version of that power series. And there are no more ends. The ends don't exist. So it was a dummy variable. And basically, a dummy variable to us is like a constant. Okay? So basically, as we get ready to take the derivative of this particular power series right here, I want you to tell yourself n is a constant, which really makes a sub n, your coefficient, totally a constant. We're not going it's not like we have to do product rule or anything like that. So here's what my derivative looks like. It's a sub n times n times x raised to the n minus one power. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our just our original most basic power rule that we ever used. The first time we ever learned a shortcut to derivatives. And then if we wanted to, we could expand that out. We could substitute a zero in for n, which actually means the first term would totally be zero because of that rascal right there. 
Uh, we could substitute a 1 in for n and get a sub 1. And then we could substitute a 2 in for n. And we would get, uh, let's see, 2 times a sub 2 times x to the first. And it's, you'll notice if you look above, it's just like taking the derivative term by term. And I think the next term, I bet you'd be able to predict, the next term would be 3 times a sub 3 times x squared, okay, and on so forth and so forth. Well, our fifth and final property here, before we jump into some real live examples, is just term by term integration. It says this is a very legal move. So if you wanted to integrate this, uh, the lowercase f would become a capital F as far as our notation is concerned. Now, um, as far as the power series goes, a sub n is a coefficient, so we don't really worry about him. We almost virtually pretend he doesn't even exist. Now, we say x we're going to add 1 to that exponent, and then we're going to divide by the new exponent. Okay. Now, one of the things, typically, how we're going to write that is we're going to say a sub n divided by n plus 1. So, Because those are all just constants, and that together makes your coefficient, and then your x to the n plus 1 power there. But again, that's just your very basic power rule, because all these are, these power series are just polynomials, and so we're just using our very basic integration rules that we learned a um, long, long time ago. And then, of course, we could start to expand that out and see what each term looked like. So if I substituted a 0 in for n, I would end up with a sub 0 times x to the first power, plus now I'm going to substitute a 1 in for all the n's, and I got a sub 1 divided by 2 times x squared. And then I'm going to substitute a 2 in for all the n's. And that would give me a sub 2 divided by 3 times x cubed plus yada, yada, yada. And what's interesting here is if you do look, if you look up here, go term by term. a sub 0 was a constant, and if you integrated him, we got a sub 0 times x. Over here, we got uh, a sub 1 divided by 2 all over x squared. Okay, so I think that one matches up quite nicely. And then if we took this term right here and integrated that term by itself, it, again, I think it matches up quite nicely, and you'll agree that that is the antiderivative right here. So it's just term by term integration, or like what the way I did it, I just substituted a 0 and a 1 and a 2 in for the n's and worked them out. What we're going to do next is I'm going to give you a fairly innocent looking power series, and I'm going to ask you to take his derivative and antiderivative and just practice uh, you know, taking the derivative of a power series. It looks scarier than it really is. So for our first example here, I'm going to give you a power series. I'm going to say that some function f of x is represented by the power series x to the nth power divided by n. And again, we'll just assume that the power series starts at n equals 0. Continue to remind yourself that n is strictly a dummy variable. In other words, we're going to treat it like a constant. So as far as the derivative goes, okay, um, I'm going to say, uh, and, and again, no quotient rule here. No quotient rule. N is a constant. Um, in fact, if you wanted to rewrite that, maybe we could just rewrite the original problem as something like this. I think that might help us. So then the derivative, uh, let's see, I'm going to have N times, well, I'm going to go real nice and slow here, N times X to the N minus 1 power, which cleans up real nice, and just X to the N minus 1 power. So there's the derivative of the given a function f of x in terms of a power series. The second thing they wanted me to do is to integrate the given function. So if I go back to the beginning and I integrate it, I'll get something like capital F of x equals, and let's see, I'm gonna, here's my coefficient that I had, and what I need to do is I need to add 1 to the exponent, and I also need to divide by that new exponent. And I'll tell you what, there's not much cleaning up here, kind of a friendly one in that regard. Our denominator would just be n times the quantity n plus 1, and that would be our antiderivative. Well, I went really above and beyond here in number 2 to create an ugly, ugly power series for you, and uh, it's definitely not a geometric one like we saw yesterday. It's a, certainly a, a notch nastier than that, but uh, I just want us to get comfortable with taking the derivative and Really, the only thing you need to focus your energy on is that numerator. The entire denominator is just a constant as far as we're concerned because it just contains dummy variables. So as far as my numerator goes, my power rule for derivatives say bring the old exponent down, 
times the quantity x minus 3 raised to the nth power because we subtracted 1. And then that denominator just kind of comes along for the ride because it was just part of, you know, we could kind of lump it into the coefficient. If we clean that rascal up just a touch, the n plus 1's cancel out, and we get the quantity x minus 3 to the nth power, all over 4 to the nth. And if we wanted to, we could even rewrite it as x minus 3 all over 4 quantity to the nth power, something like that. So there's your derivative. Now we need to totally switch gears and talk about the antiderivative of little g. So we're referring back to the original. We're going to integrate. And what I need to do, again, I'm going to totally block out the denominator for now because it's just a constant. Okay. And what I need to do to my numerator is I need to add 1 to that exponent, so it's now n plus 2, and I need to divide by the new exponent. So I'll throw an n plus 2 in the denominator. And I'll tell you what, I don't think there's any cleaning up to that rascal. That's just the way it is. Uh, so I'm going to stop right there and call that good enough for the antiderivative. So hopefully so far in today's lesson you've been cruising you know, right along without, much, uh, and without any problems at all. But, and I think we're going to you know, finally start to challenge you here with example number three, we'll call this. And they want me to find a power series for this ugly looking function natural log of the quantity x plus 1. Now, as far as finding a power series, our options are pretty limited. The only thing we really discussed is a geometric power series, okay? And so what we have to first do is we have to take the function that was given to us and we have to rewrite it in the form of a over 1 minus r. And then once we get it in that form, we are capable of rewriting it as a times r raised to the nth power, assuming that n starts at 0. Okay? But the whole key hinges on the idea that we're first of all able to rewrite the function in that format. And when you look at the function that I've given you, there's, there's no way that I'm going to be able to rewrite this function as such. But if we get real sneaky, real sneaky, I could take the derivative of the given function. We could say that f prime, the derivative of the given function, is du over u. Okay? So that's one of the first derivatives we did back in September. And we know... Okay, if we use our commutative property on the bottom, all right, and we know, ooh, that fits real nice. We could say that that's just negative x to the nth power. Or we could say that that is negative 1 to the nth power times x to the nth power, all right? So we've at least, we haven't written f in, as a power series, but we've written f prime as a power series. So now what I can do is I can swoop in here and I can just integrate everything. All right, I want to integrate that rascal and I want to integrate this rascal. And, and essentially we could pretend that we were integrating this one as well. And if I do carry out that integration, here's what I would get. The f prime would become an f. Okay, we could say that that's equal to the natural log of x plus 1. All right, which is equal to, and here's where I'm going to take a look at my series. I'm going to say that that's really equal to negative 1 to the nth power was just a constant. And then I could say x to the n plus 1 power, whoops, i got to slide it up just a whisker here, divided by n plus 1. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. We just wrote a power series for the natural log of x plus 1. That's a pretty remarkable feat considering we've only talked about geometric uh, power series. And so we got real sneaky. We took the derivative. We found our f prime. We expressed f prime as a power series and then integrated everything. So we know that these rascals are a perfect match within the interval of convergence. In other words, I, let's talk a little bit more about perfect match. What does a perfect match really mean? A perfect match basically says, all right, if we graphed this function in y1 of our calculator, and then we had the capability of graphing this power series, and certainly you do have that capability because all it is is a polynomial once you start to expand it out. If we graphed this rascal in y sub 2, and we hit the graph button, 
the two graphs would lay perfectly on top of each other because the per functions are perfectly equivalent within the interval of convergence. Now, what is the interval of convergence? Well, we have a real nice property we're going to take advantage of. Go back to f prime. We would have said that the interval of convergence for this function right up here that was in blue, we would have said any x value within the interval negative 1 to 1. Well, there's a property or a theorem that says all of the derivatives or antiderivatives of that function carry the same interval of convergence. So without doing any fancy tests, we could automatically assume that the interval of convergence for this crazy looking power series that's in brown is negative 1 to 1 as well. All right, we're going to wrap things up today with one more example. We'll call this number four. And this one's a pretty impressive one. I want you to write a power series for the function arctan of x. Isn't that wild? This is really hard to believe that we could do a power series for arctan of x, but it's so friendly. And again, we're trying to make it in the mold of a over 1 minus r, and there's no way we could do that with this given function. However, the derivative of arctan is extremely friendly. And if we remember our rule for the derivative of arctan, it's going to be du over 1 plus u squared, which in this case turns out to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. And uh, let's see, if we rewrote the bottom as 1 minus negative x squared, we would get a power series that looks like negative x squared to the nth power. And if we kind of just peel that apart a little bit, we'd get negative 1 to the nth power times x to the 2n power. And here's the fun part. We have that property today that says we can just swoop across this and just integrate everything there. So we're going to integrate this guy. We're going to integrate this guy. We'll integrate that function right there, that power series. And here's what we'd end up with. Uh, the f prime would turn into an f. Um, so we said that guy. Then this would just turn into the arc tangent of x, just to be consistent here. And then the series would turn into, oh baby, let's see, negative 1 to the nth stays the way it is. x is now raised to the 2n plus 1 power as I integrate, and now it would be divided by 2n plus 1. So there it is. There's a perfect power series that matches arctan, and it's going to converge as long as x squared falls within the interval negative 1 to 1, and we'll be good to go. So hopefully you enjoyed, and we'll see you tomorrow in class.